Good day and welcome 2019. We're glad to be back after a very busy fall and year's end and we have an exciting year planned with new free cycle events, spring plan a seed events, and also a return to our sustainable film series. We want to kick off our new year with a podcast that is sure to delight. Today we are visiting Radcliffe's new dean, D'Amico Brown Nagan. Enjoy and thank you so much for joining us. It's happening. We're here. Okay. Very <laughs> Welcome, good. everybody. Here we are for our next podcast installation. We're uh, here with Andrew and Tom and myself, Eric, and we're here for our, I don't remember what number of podcasts, but we're probably six or seven anyway. Yeah. And we have to say, uh, it's been going good, but we've got a very special guest here today. <laughs> our new dean, Miko. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, for thank coming. you. Welcome. Thanks for thank uh, you. having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. So, we wanted to. Um, you know, talk about sustainability right. a little bit, and I've got some questions that we've got, and uh, maybe we'll just start off. Sure. All right. So one of our first questions we wanted to kind of talk about is, uh, with your background in history, uh, can you talk a little bit about how learning from our past can actually uh, we can help us obtain a more sustainable future? Mm-hmm. So that's a great question. Um, I, I would... Uh, tweak the question a little bit to refer to my experience as a lawyer as well um, and as a legal historian. Um, And I say that because, you know, um, one of the courses that I've taught many times is about um, uh, the relationship between uh, the world around us, whether it's uh, in terms of the environment or uh, in terms of workplace or schools and issues of equity and access. Um, That's important because I really see sustainability as a social and economic uh, justice issue. Um, And I see it that way um, in part because of my familiarity with um, issues like uh, environmental justice. So making sure that, um, uh, say, pollution, the disposal of various pollutants occurs in a way so that all members of the uh, community bear the cost of that, um, which is important not only um, because um, you know historically lower income communities, communities of color, have tended to bear the cost of waste disposal. Um, if all of us bear those costs, then it actually incentivizes um, reducing waste uh, and just being smarter about how we uh, dispose of waste. So. Um, that's an important perspective on um, sustain- sustainability for me. Um, and I also think about it in terms of ensuring the right mix of uh, um, development and economic opportunities, so employment opportunities. Um, and I think that to the extent that um, Americans or people all over the world Um, have some question or question um, sustainability as a goal, I think it's around what they see as the perceived trade-off between um, sustainable development and uh, the creation of jobs uh, or the loss of jobs. Um, And so I think it's really important to think about um, uh, development in terms of the creation of new types of jobs, right? So... um, as you know, over time, our um, our economic system has shifted away from, certainly in some places, uh, from industry, um, which has resulted in the decline in communities where um, big industries were popular. And so um, I think that we should really have a conversation um, about green jobs, so making um, uh, sustainable development uh, something that people are excited about because um, it doesn't mean that they're going to lose um, the ways that they traditionally have supported their families um, because of this imperative of uh, sustainability that um, you know, Harvard has and other um, institutions have. Um, it doesn't have to be that it's, it's one or the other. Either you have um, a job and can provide for your family um, or you focus on um, uh, developing uh, the environment in a way that's sustainable. So that's my perspective. Yeah, that's good. No, it's you definitely have to adapt. The culture has to adapt, and uh, the infrastructure has to be built to 
make some of these industrial jobs relevant, right? Right. Mm-hmm. You know, the sustainable development. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so one other thing I will say um, about that is I'm really interested in the relationship between um, food and justice, so sustainable production of food um, and issues of, of opportunity and justice. And I'm, I'm interested in uh, ensuring that people have an equal ability to be healthy. Um, and a part of that is ensuring that food is produced in a way um, that is as, uh, you know, as free of pollutants and um, uh, you know, chemicals, things that can be harmful to the body as possible. Um, and so I think that's another angle on sustainability that should be put front and center because it's something that I think resonates with a lot of people. So I guess what I'm saying is um, I, I really want the conversation about um, environmentalism to be a bottom-up conversation and not just a top-down mm-hmm. one, right. one that's you know pushed by uh, institutions like Harvard and government. Um, but it should be something that everybody understands they have a stake in. Exactly. Yeah, share the responsibility with everybody, so yes. they all have that voice. More in the community, not necessarily just in the, what you see on TV, but also kind of what we foster in our own individual areas and communities and schools and whatnot. Yeah, Absolutely. It's interesting you talk about the relationship between food and sustainability, too. Um, kind of segues into the next question. Because mm-hmm. A lot of times, being green is often associated with just energy conservation, mm-hmm. right? To save energy, turn out your lights, or uh, managing waste, um, and other ways of just reducing your carbon footprint. Mm-hmm. But a lesser-known aspect of uh, being green is really a, a personal well-being. Mm-hmm. And uh, we understand you have, have a, a bit of a green thumb, you enjoy some gardening. Can you talk a little bit about how gardening provides uh, and cultivates a sustainable well-being for Mm you? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to talk about that. Um, It's it's something that's really near and dear to me um, because my interest in gardening was passed uh, to me from my grandfather um, who uh, grew up in a rural area and um, gardened not in the way that I did, I do, which is uh, essentially for fun and on the side. He gardened because he needed to garden in order to put food on the table. Um, and so when I was growing up, uh, every spring and summer, I would help my granddad plant his garden. And it was, you know, it was huge. It was just rows and rows of corn and okra and potatoes and um, so he definitely did all the hard work. So he had a plow and he would, you know, um, plow the soil. Um, and I would, uh, walk behind him and I would put the seeds where he said I should put the seeds. And it, it's just something that I grew up with. And, um, I definitely wasn't thinking about it as being anything other than helping my granddad out and, um, helping the family out. But later on, yeah, uh, I have, I went back to gardening in part because, uh, you know, I live in a very different context. As I said, uh, my granddad was in a rural setting, um, where, you know, the air was, was free and clear. Um, and it was pretty idyllic. Um, I have for many years lived in urban spaces where it can be harder to just get that sense of being communing with nature. Um, and I decided that I wanted to cultivate that because I do see it as a way of not only um, growing foods that are pesticide free, that are really local um, and that I'm growing them in my backyard, but also I just love the, the way that I feel like I'm one with the earth by you know putting my hands in the soil and um, just slowing the pace of life down, um, planting something, watching it grow, you know, making sure that I'm doing what I need to do for, um, for vegetables to grow. So I grow, uh, tomatoes and cucumbers, um, and, uh, arugula, uh, and various lettuces. And there's nothing that's better than, first of all, as I said, just working in the garden. It's transportive. You know, I don't have my phone around. I'm not talking to anyone else. I'm just uh, trying to um, 
trying to make things grow. And I get a big sense of achievement when that actually happens. Um, and then the vegetables that I grow in my garden are so much better. Mm -hmm. um, fresher. fresher. Yeah. yeah. Than what you can get in the store. Um, so I do have that garden. My only regret is that I can't have, you know, a big wide open garden, like the, the time, the kind that I knew when I was growing up, I don't have that much space. Um, and I also just couldn't handle <laughs> that much, that big of a garden. Um, but it's, it's really great. It really does give me a, um, a sense of and a angle onto environmentalism and sustainability that I, I wish more people could experience. Um, yeah, because it really does bring home again, something that tends to be, um, seen as far away from, uh, everyday life, but in mm -hmm. fact, it can be very close to your everyday life. Um, and it just gives me a, 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 a sense of, uh, well-being and a sense that I'm doing my part, um, to, uh, to, uh, reduce my own personal mm -hmm. or my family's carbon footprint. And it's, it's really important. It sounds like it's almost a little nostalgic too, like oh, kind is. of harkening back to yes. you know, when you were planting with your grandfather. I'm yeah. sure that's kind of a neat experience. Right, yeah. And so I have tried to get my kids <laughs> 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 to participate and, and they've done a, they've done a bit over time. Um, not as much recently as I would like for them to do, but I I uh, would like to think that yeah, you know, when I'm old and they start to think about, well, you know, what are we taking from uh, our parents that they'll remember that and maybe have their own little gardens one day. Sustainable living is important for everybody. Mm -hmm. The green on the front, can we <laughs> get some, uh, get the plow up there? Maybe. Oh, sure. Well, I think. Yeah, you mean so, green leaf. Yeah, I mean, no. <laughs> no, no, yeah, and, and green leaf. So we're actually working on that. Well, um, great. Maybe getting a little plot uh, at Greenleaf, at least for uh, growing some herbs. Should be the yeah, next yeah. Absolutely. That's yes. great. Well, there's one more question for you. Mm. You know, um, here we are at uh, Radcliffe, which is part of Harvard, and you know we see a lot of uh, new information, as we talked about a little earlier, how Harvard is really pushing to become more and more sustainable mm. for the future. And curious, in the future, how do you see Radcliffe and the university, but specifically Radcliffe within the mm -hmm. university, evolving to meet um, the new goal of becoming fossil fuel neutral by mm -hmm. 2026. Mm -hmm. I know the other directive is a little far out, but at least the yeah. 2026. Well, so um, first of all, I want to say I think it's an ambitious goal and it's a good goal. Um, and I'm glad that uh, President Faust, I think the report was issued while mm -hmm. she was still uh, president, um, had the foresight and the commitment to um, environmentalism to create a, um, a task force that came up with that recommendation and made that commitment. Um, it's, uh, it's ambitious, but um, it also means that since it's out there, uh, we all have to work towards that goal and do our part. So the first way I think that Radcliffe can um, be useful is uh, by playing its role as the university's convener, um, where scholars and uh, policymakers come together to try to think about what concrete steps can be taken to actually meet um, those goals. And so um, that's one thing that we can do. Um, but I also hope that um, when we're thinking about, uh, you know, renovating, renewing our buildings, uh, you know, we're working on the the Schlesinger um, Greenleaf eventually will undergo uh, renovations that we can think about uh, uh, ensuring that our buildings are as green as they can possibly be. Um, I also think uh, that there might be ways that we can um, move towards using solar energy. Um, and I'm not uh, quite sure. I'm sure that you, uh, Tom, would know more about um you know, how, how workable that is and what we may already be doing towards that end. Um, but, you know, I do think that although we are pretty small within the Harvard ecosystem, um, that we can uh, both raise our voices um, to contribute to solutions, but also um, with all of the buildings that we have, um, that we can try to make them as, um, as uh, 
energy efficient as possible, um, that we can move towards uh, solar, um, and I'm sure there are other ways that we can be helpful. And uh, I imagine that eventually that imperative will trickle down <laughs> from, from the university. I think you're to right. Us. <laughs> so, so we don't only have to come up with uh, our ideas about that, but we, we will have some ideas presented to us, I'm sure. Yeah, I think solar is a great one. We have we do have a small solar array up at Concord Ave, our, mm-hmm. our little satellite campus up the street. But we've looked, Tom and I, kind of the whole facilities department have looked. Greenleaf being one of them, looked at ways we could, you know, incorporate solar panels on the roof and right. on other buildings and whatnot. Yeah. It's kind of one of the more attainable ways to. You mm-hmm. know, we have our geothermal wells, which are obviously really green, but solar is a great way because it's kind of a you know one of the quicker, more attainable ways of getting that you know clean energy. Right. You know, with the infrastructure that we already have in place, yes. just slightly modifying it. So, yeah. yeah. Which there are costs associated with that, um, obviously. But um, I, for one, would love to. Uh, I The way that I can bear living in Boston, I'm not a cold weather climate person. Um, and my nature is the way that during the winter, um, it can be really cold out, but the sun is beaming. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if there's a way to increase yeah. um, those rays coming into Greenleaf and into our buildings, I would definitely be supportive of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think there's going to be some larger scale thinking. I went to a think tank about how to you know, get to that ambitious goal that you speak of as well. Um, I think the university as a whole needs to think about how we could buy more um, solar energy, wind energy. How do we get that? How do we get that to Harvard? Mm-hmm. This that would be a larger scale of that ambitious goal. Yeah. Well, and and uh, what is the date? Twenty 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 six. Yeah, for, that's for, just around the corner. For, yeah, for the neutral, neutral, for neutral, carbon neutral. Carbon neutral. Yeah. yeah, and then I think it was twenty. 54 was for um, fossil fuel free. Yeah. So obviously, you very, said, very ambitious goals. Yeah. I think it's going to be a multifaceted approach. It's not going to be any one in particular. Right. You know, whether it's you know solar or wind or electric vehicles and mm-hmm. you know reducing our waste. It's so many different aspects. And mm-hmm. in some ways, it's like I think each school will have a, be a model in some way, shape, or form. We have our wells and. Other schools have, you know, um, I think it's the design school has a huge solar array on one of their roofs. Yes. So everybody mm-hmm. kind of brings in a little uh, aspect that I think we can all learn from one another. Yeah, definitely. So. Well, the the electric vehicles, I think that's something that um, I can imagine coming down the pike pretty readily. Because we heard it owns a, a number of uh, just so many. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And like bio, you know, this biodiesel, which is, you know, kind of a step in the right direction you know yeah. there's definitely you can see the the kind of the, the wheels turning trying to get to that but i think there's still a lot of uh a lot of good conversations to come to figure out how we you know how we obtain those ambitious mm-hmm. goals mm-hmm. it'll be interesting to see for sure I think there'll be a lot more think tanks to come yeah so. absolutely and conferences yes hopefully in good places yes <laughs> yeah. Warm places. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> Thank so, you for talking thank to you. Thank you very thank much for yeah. talking to us. Taking time to, to talk. It's been great. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate it. I've, I've enjoyed any time I can reminisce about, uh, you know, days of your growing up. I, I've gotten to that age where I'm happy to look back. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Take care.